Welcome to Shred Show, I'm Chris, and this, oh this, is the internet's most stoked surfboard show. Today we have a board that's been steadily requested for the past 15 months. The clips that you're watching now were released last year and show this board being surfed with one fin, four fins, three fins, and no fins. The video these clips appeared in was probably one of the most fun to watch videos by any surfboard brand in 2013. And of course, Josh Kerr had a few clips showcasing some serious surfing with a few no grab errors and a proper turn or two. When you walk into a surf shop, the first thing worth doing is grabbing a rail on this board because it sets this board apart from others that have similar outlines. There's nothing high volume at all about this rail when you compare it to other boards that would have similarly wide tails or noses, and the rail tapers down significantly from the thickest point of the stringer all the way down to the apex of the rail. That tells us that this board is one that you can really tip on an edge and bury into the water to grind through your turns if you have the skill to surf that way. Now when we look at the foil on this board, meaning how foam distributes from the center towards the nose and the tail, we see the same thing happening that we saw here in the rails, foam very quickly leaving the thickest point of the board at center, thinning out a lot up in the nose, and most interestingly, thinning out a lot back in the tail. On normal high performance short boards, we usually see a very flat deck line from about here all the way back to the end of the tail, meaning that when a short board thins out towards the tail, it's only a function of the way that the rocker curve is eliminating thickness. But this board also eliminates thickness from the deck, meaning that there's a slight shaving away of foam angling down this way towards the tip. You can see this more easily on a new board that didn't already have a traction pad on it, but the point is that in terms of a lot of the high performance surfing that we just saw Josh Kerr doing on this board, much of this board's potential in those situations comes from how quickly it thins out towards each one of its edges in spite of how wide its plan shape is. Coincidentally, the way that this deck angles down may also tell us something about the type of traction that could be most useful on this board. This Bruce Irons pad has a vertical tail kick, which means that the very top section of the tail kick here is straight up and down like a wall. That's most commonly associated with aerial surfing because of how someone like Albie Layer can use that grip on the backside of his foot to push the board around in rotations. In this case, a pad with a vertical tail kick over 20 millimeters like this pad Pad or Albi Layers pad, for example, can add leverage in the tail to counteract some of that negative slope so that you can really crank into a turn. If we look at this board once again relative to its outline, we can see what we'd probably describe as quite a bit of nose rocker without much tail rocker, but with a definite kick happening in the last six inches or so. This shows us that nearly everything about this board's design is centered around things like quick pivots, burying rails, and fast maneuverability, while the only thing about this board that really screams ease of use or small wave surfing is the planing ability that you would expect from such a wide outline. The most interesting board to compare this board to is probably Rusty's Dwarf, which has been very popular over the last six years because of how that board's thicker foil in the nose and tail as well as fuller rails make that board really sit up above the water and feel very squirty and fast moving forward. But since every board's design is just a compromise between different feelings on a wave, you may find that the thickness everywhere on that dwarf makes it harder to bury a rail or to get off your blazing forward path of motion because thicker rails are slightly slower to respond to your immediate turning demands. So far, this board seems to create the same sort of small wave utility as a dwarf, but it does so much differently, for example, adding more width in the tail for better planing ability and taking away volume and thickness nearly everywhere else to make this board feel slightly more down in in the water while you're surfing it. This all highlights the fact that surfboard performance is always totally subjective and up to you as a surfer because Rusty essentially makes two different boards for identical waves that both offer completely different feelings beneath your feet that are fun for different reasons. Very slight concave on either side of the stringer. Stringer coming up above the rails so we can rock this just slightly. Concave on each side of the stringer staying shallow, not deepening through the fins, all the way out the tail. That's really Really interesting because the depth of each concave on either side of the stringer is staying shallow throughout the board 
and it's not deepening at all as we go through the fin cluster. Most importantly, the stringer is elevated above the rails all the way through the board, helping the width of this board in its back third especially tip rail to rail. That also relates slightly to how the quad boxes are placed in this board. You see, on most rusty surfboards, you find that the quad boxes are placed closer together and further back towards the end of the tail than what you would find in most boards by other shapers because that keeps some thrusterish feelings in a quad setup. For example, on a thruster, you feel an immediate controlled pivot when you initiate a turn. However, this board places the quad boxes closer to the rail than normal when you compare this to other rusty boards. What that means is that you may feel an uncontrolled slide and drift on the water as you begin to initiate a turn, but once that back quad trailer catches, you feel that unique drive and power on your rail that only comes from a true quad setup where the boxes are closer to the rail like this. You may find that a very fun thing to feel on this board, and of course, if you want more thruster type feelings in your quad setup, you can always adjust for that by adding a nubster fin, a small one, into your thruster box to complement the other four fins in your board. Now, in a surf shop, you'll most commonly find a happy shovel shaped from a polyurethane blank and then laminated with polyester resin. This is the most common kind of surfboard construction that most everyone is used to. This board is much different though because it's a standard polyurethane blank cut into the shape that you see in front of your eyes now, but it uses epoxy resin to laminate the fiberglass to the polyurethane core. That means that this board has the added strength and resiliency of epoxy resin without feeling as light as a more traditional epoxy board that would be made out of an EPS foam core instead of a polyurethane foam core. Many like this kind of epoxy resin coupled with fiberglass and polyurethane cores because they say that it helps their boards keep pop for longer. The boards feel lively without losing their original character. But here's the twist to the story of this board. This blank was shaped at Rusty in San Diego and then it was sent to Hydroflex in Oceanside. And what sets Hydroflex apart is that they do not just take the shaped blank and then lay fiberglass on it and then pour epoxy resin and spread it around to laminate the board, they actually inject fiberglass and epoxy roots into the foam core. It's amazing to look at this board under the studio lights because you can see all the tiny little pinholes where fiberglass and resin is actually down shot into the polyurethane blank. Hydroflex epoxies are a favorite of Rusty team rider Josh Kerr, who you see on a Rusty Hydroflex now, as well as many of last week's US Open competitors like Mason Ho, Carissa Moore, Cam Richards, and others. Okay, so what does all of this really mean? Well, if you're the type who notices that your boards seem to lose pop and character after you surf them a bunch, you may notice how boards built by Hydroflex feel new for longer because of how tightly the whole board is bonded together. But for most surfers, the real benefit with Hydroflex boards is that they don't delaminate in heat. Of course, delamination is when the fiberglass and resin actually become detached from the foam core and it's most commonly caused by parking your car in the sun while your board is in it and then just letting it bake for a few hours while you're at work or school. Since this board was fiberglassed and laminated by Hydroflex, you could leave it in the car all day and the wax would melt off, thus destroying the upholstery in your car, but your board won't suffer any heat damage like a standard epoxy or polyester resin board might. To wrap this all up, I think that this shape is more capable of being surfed in an aggressive, high-performance way than the outline may suggest. You'd likely find that it goes best in about knee to maybe shoulder high waves, especially if you want something with a more down in the water, rail gouging feeling than something like a dwarf would give you. If you want an extra light, floaty option, you could probably really optimize this shape for super small waves by having it shaped from an EPS blank and then laminated and glassed using Hydroflex's Apex 2 epoxy. And if you want something not quite as light that likely deals with chop on the water better, you could copy this board with a polyurethane blank and Hydroflex's Apex 2 Epoxy. Now, Shred Nation, to possibly win a brand new Bruce pad from DeKine, drop a comment down below telling us what type of surfboard construction you prefer and why. Is it epoxy? Is it PU? Do you like them both? I found out recently that DeKine's traction is specifically formulated to feel exactly the same in warm and cold water, so that's why you don't go flying to Santa Cruz and find your traction feeling hard, and then fly to Nicaragua and find that it feels really soft. Also, if you've ever wondered why the edges bevel down on the tail kit, 
kicks of Dekine's pads, it's because they found that it reduces drag in the face of a wave. For example, if you imagine this pad on the tail of a surfboard in the face of a steep wave, the water would be wrapping around the tail, and if they didn't shave this down right here, that would actually create more opportunity for the water to hug around the board and drag and clip against the tail pad. A lot of Dekine's team really likes this pad because of how the extreme vertical tail kick coupled with the eight millimeter arch creates a really good opportunity for your foot to have that locked in firm feeling. You may also like this pad on small wave boards like this because you can place these two forward pieces up as much as you want on the board so that when you move your foot up to generate speed and get through flat spots on small waves, you don't just have traction when you're jumping up and down. It's also helping prevent dents on the deck of your board. To keep things exciting, we'll give away two Bruce pads at the end of the week to two of your comments chosen down below. If you can't wait, you can find this pad at Surfride by clicking the link below this video. Shred Nation, that is it for this episode. If you're surfing a happy shovel or any other boards by Rusty, tell us what you think in the YouTube comments down below. I'm gonna go surfing. I hope the water's warm and the waves are fun wherever you call home and we'll see you soon on Shred Show.